Well, good morning and, and welcome. My name is Darren, if I haven't met you yet. And I just want to show a slide from yesterday. A lot of us from Valley were at the Walk for Life. Well, I guess I have the clicker here. And we had a great morning. Who, who was there from Valley? Uh, raise your hand if you either ran or walked or just ate like I was inclined to do. They had all kinds of great food there. And after eating, who wanted to walk or run? Honestly. But anyway, it was great. Uh, a lot of money was raised for real options, Obria Medical Clinics, and we had great fellowships, saw friends from other churches. And so next year, be a part of Team Valley, and, uh, and you'll be blessed, and we'll continue uh, Valley's partnership with them. Okay, let me just jump right in here when our son Ethan was in kindergarten. He dressed up one Halloween for his school parade as Super Y. He was in kindergarten, and he thought this would be really cool. I guess this maybe started the superhero craze. I don't know, but he thought Super Y would be an excellent costume. And if you don't know, Super Y is a PBS character who solves problems and big mysteries by reading books. That's what he does. And, and again, Ethan thought, wow, that, that is uh, the, the costume for me. And so on the, the big day, again, he was just in kindergarten. We were living in Boulder Creek. I drove him to school. And because he was little, I didn't just want to drop him off at the curb, but walked him all the way to his classroom. And uh, in fact, I think I have a shot here of Ethan as Super Y here. All right. So you can just see he, he rocked that costume pretty good. We were, we were walking to his classroom. He's going to kill me for this, by the way. He didn't know this was coming. But anyway, uh, we get to the corner of the building, and this big fifth grade boy jumps out with this like, kind of hideous monster mask that the big kids would wear and just makes this loud shriek, and Ethan just leaps back. I mean, just like a cat and just freezes. And, uh, and the kid just looks at him and just pulls his mask aside and says, Ha! I scared you! just remember this completely. And Ethan looks right at him, and he says in his squeaky voice, again, I've never forgotten, you didn't scare me. You startled me, <laughs> but you didn't scare me. <laughs> and then he just marched right on to his kindergarten classroom. And that forever has been a line in our, our family. It's part of the family lore. It's, you did this, but you didn't do that. You did X, but you didn't do Y. Just all kinds of variations. And something similar is what the Apostle Paul is saying in this very rich little passage that we're looking at, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 8, uh, over these six weeks as we take just a little pause in the story to kind of line up with Easter. Last week, Glenn talked about the first line where Paul says, I'm afflicted in every way, but not crushed. And, and this week, Paul adds on to it, saying something similar, but just a little different. And he says this, he says, I'm perplexed, but not driven to despair. And when he wrote this line, perplexed, but not driven to despair, he actually had a smile on his face. And a, and a gleam in his eye because he was making a joke. He's actually making a play on words that's very easy to miss unless you're a Greek speaker. And I'll keep you in suspense for just a minute on what that joke is. But let me just say this, that, that as we get going, let me just back up. You know, we're always trying to make what goes on at, at Valley Church beginner friendly. So if you've just come in and maybe like, Thomas said earlier, you're just exploring this great faith or this church, you can kind of begin to get a sense of some of the fixed points. And one of the things we always talk about, as you know, if you have observed Christians at all, we're always talking about the Bible. Well, you might be asking, what is the Bible? And what is the Bible all about? This is not on the screen, but it's in your notes. It's the Bible is God's true, it's a true story about God and his quest to recover his lost treasures, human beings, and to restore his aching, bruised creation, the heavens and the earth, so that he can dwell with us in this paradise regained according to his original plan. That's what the Bible is about. 
in a nutshell. The Bible is a lost treasure story, and you are a treasure to God. Well, how God recovered his people and uncursed the earth below us and the sky above us is, um, is, is, is just an amazing story with all kinds of, of twists and turns and people and so on. But you should know that it ends with a bang. It ends with excitement and triumph, this victorious war and a beautiful wedding. And what's more, it's historically verified. There is corroborating evidence from the world of history and geography and archaeology that supports what it says. In fact, I got a big dose of Bible confirmation two weeks ago when Becky and I were on this life-changing trip to Israel. And I really wish that I could tell you Israel stories because I was just amazed at, at seeing the land of the Bible. Here's just one quick picture as we were walking up to the Temple Mount, looking down on the western wall that, that King Herod built. I, I, just, I was amazed at just confirmation after confirmation after confirmation about what the Bible says about ancient Israel. And it was just a, very much a faith builder. Well, back to 2 Corinthians, where this little perplexed but not driven to despair line comes from. What's that book all about? Well, it's one of the Bible's 66 separate books, even though it's, it's a letter and not a full-length book. And, and Paul, get this, whose place is with Plato and Socrates in terms of the world's great thinkers. That's no exaggeration. Well, he's a major Christian leader and one of the most amazing people who ever lived. And he wrote to a group of people living in Corinth, uh, this port city, maybe 80,000 population. And there was this little cluster of people who came to believe the story of this treasure questing God that had reached its high point in the arrival about 20 years before the letter was written of God's treasure questing son, Jesus, who gave his life to get us back to God. Well, Paul came to them in AD 50 or so and spent 18 months with them and told them about Jesus and formed this network of house churches. And then Paul went on his way because his mission was to continue to share the good news about Jesus far and wide. Well, after Paul left, another leader that, uh, named Apollo showed up. Great guy, Jewish convert, but from an outward standpoint, he was more impressive. And some of the Corinthians rallied to him, not just because of his substance, which was there, but because of his style. And this created some, some conflict and some, uh, some disregard for, for the Apostle Paul's authority and so on. And then Paul found out that you can take people out of Corinth, but you can't take the Corinth out of people too easily. And they were having all these challenges with sexuality and attitude and relationships and so on. And worst of all, they were denying the bodily resurrection which for Paul was an enormous problem. Well, Paul loved them, and he wrote a letter that is called 1 Corinthians to help them with all these issues. But then Timothy brought news that what Paul wrote had made them mad, and they basically tore up the letter, at least a lot of them in their community did. So Paul was, was pretty crushed by this, and he sails straight for Corinth, and he makes this so-called painful visit to them, where he really was rebuffed in many ways. And he returns to Ephesus, where he had these really high expectations for great gospel expansion and success. But the situation there deteriorated, and he ended up on death row for getting sideways with the authorities. And so you can imagine uh, this one-two punch. First, uh, the problems in Corinth, and then in Ephesus, and so on. And so he was in what we're calling a life crisis in this series. And he writes about this crisis in vague terms in chapter 1, verse 8, where he says, we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction. Remember Glenn talked about that last week, a word that actually has a literal sense of confinement or squeezing. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. So he had a death sentence, a failed ministry, and personal rejection. And this was an imperfect storm of sorrow. And to use a, a boxing metaphor, which Paul often used, he was on the ropes. 
And in the movie Rocky IV, I'm kind of a, a fan to some degree. I'm a little ashamed to admit it of the Rocky movies. A lot of great quotes and inspiration. But anyway, in Rocky IV, Rocky is fighting this enormous Russian fighter named Drago. And he gets back to his corner after this ferocious onslaught from Drago. And Rocky, whose eyes are closing up and are swollen, says this, I see three of him out there. And Polly, his, his brother-in-law, and this has become kind of a quote, said, hit the one in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's exactly what Paul did. He got up again and he continued to fight in this great battle of, of, of faith. Well, anyone would, you would think, uh, throw in the towel, to use another boxing metaphor, but not Paul, but not because of Paul. In fact, if you're new to English, you might not know this expression. To throw in the towel means to give up. And the, the image does come from the world of boxing where a, a fighter or maybe the fighter's trainer to indicate that the fight is done, he throws in the towel. Well, not Paul. He holds on to his towel all through his life. He doesn't resign from the ministry. He doesn't go back to the synagogue. And not only is he not shaken up for long, but he himself continues to shake up the world. How? How is he not collapsing? Why doesn't he just lie down on the canvas? Well, we'll, we'll find out. And as we know, he lived to tell about this storm of disappointment because God delivered him from, this is 2 Corinthians 1.9, this deadly peril. But things with the Corinthians were only partially patched up. And when he writes about these experiences to the Corinthians and writes this line about perplexed but not driven to despair, now we understand the context a little better about why he would say such a thing. He was confused about some things going on around him, but he wasn't knocked out. Why? Well, those six words that we read, perplexed but not driven to despair, again, there's a little joke in there. And you're probably thinking, I don't get the joke. Well, you, you wouldn't if you don't speak Greek. As, as I mentioned before, a Greek speaker would pick up some humor here. Paul often used wordplay and irony and humor in his letters, and he does so here. He writes, and I put this in your notes, I am aporeo, meaning perplexed, but not ex aporeo, meaning driven to despair. So it's the same word, but the second one just has a little prefix on it, which changes the meaning, but only changes the sound just a little bit. So he's got a little twinkle in his eye here. And some Bible versions try to give a sense of the wordplay, so one version has, I'm sometimes at a loss, but I'm not a loser. Get that loss and loser? Another version has, I'm bewildered, but never at my wit's end. You can hear the W sound here. So Paul is being funny here. So here's my attempted translation. It's more thought for thought. And again, it takes, it, uh, takes from the boxing arena, which Paul was well aware of. I think what he's saying is, I'm throwing up my hands but I'm never throwing in the towel. Throwing up your hands is, something, is exasperation. He's exasperated. And, and we get exasperated. I remember my dad would throw up his hands every week when I would forget to bring the garbage cans in. Week after week after week. Oh, the, the consternation from my wonderful father. Well, that's, that's exasperation. And Paul was aporeo, meaning he was confused and, and at a loss sometimes uh, because we see how human he is but he was never ex apareo. He didn't come to pieces psychologically. He didn't lose his mind. Even after his near-death experience at Ephesus and this emotional sucker punch from the Corinthians. And if we look around in our culture, we see that people are coming to pieces left and right. Our, our neighbors are ex aporeoing all around us. In fact, I just... Uh, read this, this article that's been sitting on my, on my desk called Americans Have Never Been Sicker by John McGillian. And he writes a number of things that life expectancy in the U.S. continues to fall. And a number of, of just huge numbers of people suffering with anxiety and depression. I mean, how often now do we hear references to suffering and mental health and people coping or so-called coping with drugs and alcohol and even now psychedelics? 
It's becoming a big thing to manage anxiety and depress existential angst as if that would be a solution. In fact, I just read this morning in, in the newspaper that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is going to get a new number. It's going to get a three-digit number, like 911. It's going to be 988 to give people quick access to mental health resources. Isn't that fascinating? But the concern is there won't be enough people to answer the calls because the volume will be so great. President Biden just talked this last week in the State of the Union about mental health and the crisis in this country. And it'd be easy just to blame COVID, wouldn't it? And say, oh, well, it's the masks and the lockdowns and so on. But we know that these trends existed long before this pandemic afflicted the nation and the world. Has the pandemic made things worse? Of course. The, the recent Mental Health America report said that in 2019, just before the pandemic, some 50 million American adults were experiencing mental illness. That's before the pandemic. And what's worse, or what's more, suicidal ideation is on the rise. The national rate of suicidal ideation among adults has increased every year since 2011 and 2012. I just read, I'm sure you did too, about this, this kid up at Stanford, this soccer player who just took her own life out of despair. And, and she's just one of just thousands of, of examples of despair and, and sickness of various sorts of the heart and the mind and the body that are afflicting our neighbors and, and, and even ourselves. And maybe as a church, we can help with this. You know, maybe we can pool some of our wisdom and experiences from the great physician. Not that we have it all down ourselves, not that we're bulletproof, not that we're not fragile, but we have some resources that we can share. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. But back to Paul. What supported Paul? What gave him strength? Because he had grown resilient. But it wasn't a resilience native to Paul. It wasn't innate strength. He admitted profound weakness. He had already written in the letter we're studying that he was convinced that he could do nothing apart from God. But Paul tapped into a resilience reservoir. It was a resilience outside of himself. You could call it an alien resilience. And that's why he didn't throw in the towel. Well, Okay, I've left you in suspense long enough. How could Paul hold up during crises with hope and even a robust sense of humor that we see through his letters? And there are three answers. Here we go. It's that Paul has the ideal companion who shows him a complete picture and who leads him to practice, practice, practice. So providential, that Thomas read that verse from Philippians twice about practicing these things. We'll get to that. Here we go. An ideal companion. You know the story. Paul was on his bounty hunt for Christians, members of the way, when he left, Damas or left Jerusalem and approached Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then the voice said, I am Jesus. And then this powerful love relationship between man and Messiah took off. One of the most productive divine human relationships the world has ever known. And from that moment, Jesus became Paul's heart preoccupation. This tender relationship with his resurrected Messiah who stopped him in his tracks. And this wasn't just a relationship of, uh, of friendship. It was effectiveness. Because two are better than one. And they have a good return for their labor. And Paul and the Lord were engaged in a project, just like every believer and the Lord is engaged in some kind of a project for the kingdom. And we know what happens next. We learn that right away after getting his sight back and getting baptized, he goes down into the desert. Galatians 1, 17, or 15 through 17. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, I went away into Arabia. There are a couple of reasons for this. First, no question, he starts to preach right away to the Bedouins and the Nabataeans south of the Dead Sea. But it wasn't just to announce the Messiah. 
He got into seclusion to get acquainted with the Messiah. See, the other disciples, apostles, they had an opportunity to interact with the Lord, but now he needed an intense time to get to know his Messiah. And the desert isn't a place for punishment, but for simplicity and for intense personal encounter. And I love the way, this imaginative way that Jerry Jenkins in his, his Paul novel, which is fiction, but it's pretty good, called Empire's End, he imagines this. In his rendering, Paul lives with believers who had fled, and every day he meets with the Lord in solitude and silence. And the Lord takes Paul deep into God's mind and heart and ways and purposes. And in these daily encounters, Jenkins has God speaking almost verbatim all that Paul will write in his 13 letters. I don't know if that's true, but I like it. I think that's what was going on down in Arabia, this intense encounter with the Messiah. Well, Paul wasn't at this point just talking to the Lord. He had done that all his life. Now he was talking with the Lord. It was back and forth prayer because he was in the Messiah and the Messiah was in him. And what happened? Acts reports that Paul increased all the more in strength. So growing companionship with Jesus was his joy, was his uplift, was a a towel-holding reality for him. And he said, using a relationship term, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, his ideal companion. And all those Psalms that he had probably memorized since boyhood took on new meaning. He read Psalm 84, my soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. And now his soul yearned for the company of his Lord, the Messiah. And he met with him and talked to him and learned from him. In fact, Paul referred, this is just amazing, to this closeness in terms of Messiah internalization. Christ in me. And I love what this old pastor, James Stewart, how he describes this. He says, Christ in me means Christ bearing me along from within. Christ the motive power that carries me on. Christ giving my whole life a wonderful poise and lift and turning every burden into wings. All this is in it when the apostle speaks of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, that's the first resilience factor. He had this ideal companion. See, the Messiah inside, to use a modern slogan, was his superpower. He wasn't Paul Strong. You see that now after a tragedy, Boston strong or this strong. No, he wasn't Paul strong. He was Messiah strong. And Messiah's strength is available to everybody who has union with Christ. What's the second resilience reason? Second reason why he grasped his towel and never threw it into the ring? Here it is, a complete picture. The Messiah gave Paul a complete picture when he was in Arabia and afterwards when he was in Tarsus, before his first missionary journey. Yes, he was in Arabia to do some preaching, but he was also there to do some learning, intense learning. With the Spirit of Christ as his teacher, he went full super Y, and he read like crazy. And a lot of the puzzles and the problems and the gaps were cleared up. In fact, I just got to show you this. When we were in, in Israel... Uh, We flew back, had one day with Becky's aunt and uncle in Washington, D.C., and wanted to go to the Bible Museum, but it was closed. So we thought, well, we'll just take a long walk all through the mall. And it was a beautiful day. It was the day of the State of the Union. So surprisingly, very few people around, just a lot of law enforcement. And anyway, we're walking between, you can kind of see it here, the Capitol and the Washington Monument. And uh, I said, oh, Becky, just stop right here. Let's get one of these panoramic pictures. So there she is, and you can see what is normally humanly impossible to see in one view. You can see the Capitol, and you can see the Washington Monument. And it's made possible by iPhone's panoramic picture function, right? Where you get this horizontally elongated view. Well, I think that's a picture of the picture that the Lord gave Paul when he was in Arabia. He gave him a view that is humanly impossible of past, present, and future in salvation history. And get this, 
Paul loved what he saw. Seeing history from a wide angle gave him a buoyancy, an excitement, a vibrancy about his life and his mission. First, with the Messiah in his heart, he saw the Savior on all these pages. He had read for all these years, but the scales were over his mind still. But now with the scales removed, he saw the Messiah. And what he did, this is amazing, he read his Bible backwards. He started with the prophets like Isaiah 53, and he saw that Jesus was the suffering servant who carried our diseases and our, and our sins. And then he read back further into the writings to the, um, the Psalms, and he saw that the suffering servant was also Jesus the king whom his father would install and for whom all would bow down someday and bend the knee to this great king. And he read back even further into Genesis and discovered that Jesus was the offspring who would crush the head of the ancient servant, serpent. So the Messiah showed him that Jesus isn't a new story, but Jesus is the next chapter in an old, old story. God's treasure-seeking story. He finally understood the gaps were filled in. He read Exodus 12 and discovered that the Passover lamb was actually a prefiguring of Jesus, the ultimate Passover lamb. And in this semi-solitude and quiet, he read like crazy. He read with the Messiah instructing him. And that's why scholars have noted that Paul's 80 pages, that's what is his whole corpus of letters, filled with Old Testament quotes and even echoes that you don't notice because he was so saturated in the Old Testament seeing the Messiah everywhere. And not only did he look back, but he also looked forward with the, with the instruction of the Messiah. And he recognized too that all that was said about Jesus was in accordance with the scriptures. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. It was all right there. Jesus was promised. But now he could see. And also, too, he moved forward. And I love this right here. He looked not just backwards into Israel's history, but he looked forward. And what he saw thrilled his heart. He read, because the Lord revealed to him, or he wrote, for this light momentary affliction, squeezing, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Glory is this slippery, marvelous word that refers to human beings being caught up in transcendent circumstances, in the presence and the joy and the holiness of God without fear, without coming to pieces, in full exaltation. He said, that's what's coming. And he wrote about the resurrection of the body And he wrote about the restoration of the creation. And he wrote about death being destroyed and no longer having a hold on believers so that even if they die, it's only as if it's sleep. That's a metaphor for departed believers. Last Saturday, Becky and I blitzed down to Bakersfield for uh, our last visit with a dear friend of ours, a woman we've known for 35 years. Her name is Jan Cole. And her, she and her husband, Dan, and their daughter have been family friends of ours for years. Our lives have totally intertwined. I met them when I was a 17-year-old camp counselor at Camp Hammer. And Dan became a mentor, and his wife, Jan, the same. And, uh, and she, over the last four years, had, had gotten this kind of dementia. And so Dan had texted me right before the Israel trip and said, hey, i got to bring Jan up to the Bay Area and visit our friends up here from Twin Lakes Church and Camp Hammer because... She's going to be with the Lord soon. And I said, got it, Dan. I'll take care of all the arrangements. Just tell me when you're going to come. Get into D.C. He texts me and says, she's not going to make it that long. And if you guys want to see her, you better get down now. So we just hopped in the car, went down there, had a great visit. She wasn't real conscious, but I think she had a sense that we were there. And then on Tuesday, right before staff meeting, I get a text from Dan. And he said this, I woke up to Jan, but Jan woke up to Jesus. That's all it said. And just the confidence that, that Dan and, and, and Jan have in the Lord and their daughter, Aaron, just moves me. Just the fruitfulness and unshakableness of their faith. This isn't what they wanted. She's only 75. His parents, who I knew, lived to like almost 100. That's what they had hoped for. But that's not what God in his providence had given them. But they're unshaken. 
Well, Paul's, the gaps were filled in, and that's one of the reasons, the second reason why he held onto his towel. He had a complete picture. And then finally, what's the last, uh, the last towel grasping reality here? It's this. It's he had the ideal companion who gave him a complete picture and who then led him to practice, practice, practice. You know, after his conversion, Paul lived with simplicity, focus, and strength-building habits. He trained to be changed into the character of Jesus, the Son of God, his ideal companion, who died for sins and rose in resilient victory. He trained with the Messiah. And training, ongoing training, which characterized Paul's life, showed that he fully leaned into the happy kingdom promised long ago in the Law and the Prophets. It was proof the way he arranged his life. He trained systematically to gain power and capacity to care for others, which he did all through his life. He trained systematically to squeeze out the old tendencies that would diminish his special opportunity and jeopardize his future reward. He trained for the sheer joy of being alive in Christ. Grace working through a thoughtful plan that he adopted made deep change possible. And change he did. Paul went from, I do the very thing I hate in the beginning of his journey with Jesus to, I am not aware of anything against myself towards the end of the journey. Catch this. Paul could do from long practice, enabled by the Holy Spirit, what he really wanted to do. Not many believing people can really say that, but he could. And it wasn't because of quantum character leaps. It wasn't because of huge and sudden increases or advances in his love or his patience or his self-control. No, it was through practice and the Holy Spirit, he became a proficient Christian and a very fine human being. And he was able to entreat his friends with meekness and gentleness of Christ. That was not innate to Paul meekness and gentleness, because God had changed him, but he had cooperated. These attributes, again, were developed over time, not overnight, but over time. See, Paul was a master practitioner of whole new humanity. And as one person wrote in a famous encyclopedia article about Paul, last line, it said that Paul was the best man that the world possessed. And I think our world needs more Paul-like men and women who are sturdy, who are reliable, who are developing and changing and training and can help others along the way with so many sick, so many depressed, so many anxious. That's why, again, it's shocking or not so shocking that Paul then was unembarrassed to say repeatedly, he said this about seven times in his letters, uh, to imitate him as he imitates Christ. And again, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Let's have the band come up. Uh, how our neighbors need peace I was, like I said, I was in Israel and I heard the greeting shalom again and again and again, which means peace, Susan knows, right? It means peace, but it's a greeting, right? But peace is the fruit of patient, long-term, no quick fix practice in partnership with the Holy Spirit. And that's available to us and it's available to our neighbors. It wasn't just the Damascus Road encounter or the seventh heaven vision that made him strong. Hey, Peter faltered after a great vision, right? After a great experience. No, it was systematic practice made possible by active ongoing engagement with Jesus the Messiah working through a plan.